Welcome back. Defense attorney Ashley Merchant has appealed the decision by Judge Scott McAfee saying that District Attorney Fonnie Willis can remain on the Trump election interference case if Nathan Wade, the special assistant district attorney, is removed from the case. As we know, and as you probably are aware, the special assistant district attorney Nathan Wade has put in his resignation and Fonnie Willis remains on the case. However, the defense attorney has now done an interview and she has done several interviews actually now speaking out about why she's appealing the case and what grounds she's appealing the case on. Without further ado, you know I don't like to waste any time. Let's get into this uh, conversation with the defense attorney. Now you are appealing that decision, but tell me on what grounds are you going to appeal? We're appealing it on a couple different grounds. We definitely thought that there was evidence of forensic misconduct. So we thought that the judge got that wrong and that there was evidence that based on a couple things that she did. When the defense attorney here talks about forensic misconduct, because I don't know that she's going to define it in this interview, she's talking about a statement made by a district attorney or a prosecutor that is inappropriate. Usually we see this in the context of a district attorney making a statement to the news saying, yes, the defendant is guilty. He committed this crime, right? So that's an example of forensic misconduct. And here, the defense attorney presumably is going to go on to talk about the speech that Bonnie Willis made at a church where she was talking about how the defense attorneys are playing the race card. They are essentially being racist. They are treating her poorly because of her position as a black woman, putting her down, things of that nature. And so the defense attorneys are saying that this was highly improper conduct for the district attorney to partake in. And we think that the judge got it wrong when he said that the district attorney did not participate or did not have any forensic misconduct. And she in fact did. And so the defense attorneys are saying that the judge got it wrong when he said that uh, District Attorney Willis did not have any forensic misconduct in the case. And we're going to listen in to why Ashley Merchant, the defense attorney, says that or thinks that. One of them was this what we call the church speech. Um, you know, after I filed the motion and before it actually was responded to, she went at Martin Luther King um, Jr., Day, she went in front of the church and actually gave this, this speech, this almost like sermon, where she was talking about my motives, talking about my client's motives, talking about the different, um, you know, factors of the case that she had hired three different people and that we were only calling out one and that it must be racist. And so that was one count. Um, there was also a book that she gave some unprecedented access to the authors. Let's talk about that first count, right? Let's talk about that speech because in it, I don't know that I agree with the defense attorney here for the reason that typically when you're talking about forensic misconduct, you're talking about the guilt of the, or the innocence of the defendant, something about the defendant's character. You're talking down to the defendant such that the case is you're not going to have a fair case, right? If we go back to this opinion, I'm going to pull this up on the side of my screen here. We go to this opinion by Judge Scott McAbee. He really defines forensic misconduct at the top. It says here, the Georgia Supreme Court has recognized that forensic misconduct or improper comment by the state as grounds for disqualification. One such example is expression by the prosecuting attorney of his personal belief in the defendant's guilt, right? That's not the only example, but that's typically what you're gonna be looking for, right? A prosecutor's opinion concerning the merits of the case. If you listen to what Ashley Merchant just said there, and if I understand it correctly, right, she's talking about the prosecutor making comments about herself and the motives of the defense attorneys uh, saying that they are filing this motion or that they are talking about her in this way because they're racist, right? So I don't know. I can see kind of tangentially or how she would upend that into saying that she's talking about the merits of the case, that the district attorney is talking about the merits of the case, because if you're saying that the defense attorneys and the defendant have improper motivations impro improper motivations in filing their motions. Maybe you're saying that the merits of the case are weak. Again, this is going to be a hotly contested issue, right? Because you see here, on the one hand, the district attorney saying that she wasn't talking about the motivations of the defendants or why they're filing these, these allegations, these charges. She's talking about how she feels as a Black woman. She's being disrespected and some of the emails that she's being sent by Attorney Saddow and some of the other uh, defense attorneys on the case, they're being she's being sent disrespectful emails. But on on the other hand, the defense attorney is saying, no, you're talking about our motivations for the case. You're saying that we filed these motions or that we're talking to you in a certain way because we're we, because you're a black woman. Right. And that's not true. We are talking to you or we're filing these motions. We're saying what we need to say because we believe that our clients have rights and we are protecting our clients rights. So district attorney, by you saying that our my motivations are not all the way proper, you're also talking about the merits of the case because you're saying that I didn't file this motion because I believed in it. I filed this motion because I just wanted to frustrate you, right? So you're saying that the merits of the case, district attorney are not great. I think 
I certainly think that it's an appealable issue. I think it's something that the defense attorney can rightfully bring up. I don't know that she will be successful in that. But again, in this area, we don't have a whole lot of case law. We don't have a whole lot of precedent because something like this is typically not done. Again, as a district attorney taking on a high profile case, typically you are not spending any time and if you are spending any time, it's very little time talking to reporters, doing news interviews, you know, talking about uh, talking to a book pub publisher, things like that. It's just something that we don't see a lot in these cases and for good reason, right? Because you do end up the, the topic of conversation and maybe even the topic of a disqualification motion, as we see here. Um, into the, the decision making room where she made decisions on this indictment. So we thought that was forensic misconduct. But that plus the relationship and plus the way that everyone testified, the manner that they testified, we think all of that was enough to show mm. that she should be removed from this case. And yet, Ashley, the judge did not agree with you on a number of those aspects. I mean, the church speech in particular, he did address that notion, um, did believe that it may have had an impact on a jury pool. But of course, it was a prospective one that was in the distant future. But on the issues particularly of... Yes, let's talk about that. So in the order, the judge did say, look... This case is too far removed from a trial to have an impact on the jury. So because we don't know when this case is going to trial, probably not going to trial in 2024 because there's the appeal, there's yada, yada, yada. There's all the stuff that has to happen. Probably not. So the judge said, look, right, it, it might be a different uh, question, a different inquiry if we did have a jury picked and, and or we did have a prospective jury pool. We're getting close to trial, but we don't. And for that reason, I don't think that the speech had an impact on the jury pool. So, you know, you might not agree with that, but that's essentially what the judge said in the order. The misconduct in the witnesses themselves. You know, you had witnesses who took the stand. There were a couple that really stood out to me. One was the former employee of the DA's office. There weren't many follow-up questions to corroborate when she had seen them kiss or hug in that respect. Also, you had the former um, law partner and friend and lawyer of Nathan Wade, Terrence Bradley, I believe. And it seemed as though he was refusing to admit much of the conversations you claimed to have had with them. Even he was evasive. He did not want to answer questions citing privilege. Do you think he led you astray and did you misjudge the quality of his testimony? Ooh. No. And you know why? I, I know Terrence. I've known him for many years. I think he was truthful in his conversations with me. And if you look at how things happen, you look at the timeline, he was talking to me. He was very truthful. He had a lot of context. And that's one of the things that we look for when we're evaluating credibility. Do you have context to what you're telling? And he would tell me things and then give me context, you know, give me details that only someone who actually had firsthand knowledge would know. And I was also able to corroborate a lot of things. So he gave me details such as Robin Yurdy. He led me to Robin Yurdy, and I was able to, to, to actually corroborate Robin Yurdy, corroborate the condo. He had led me to that. So those were things that told me that he was telling me the truth. But when well, he, he may was on have the stand... Led, oh, excuse me. I was going to go to that very point. I'm sure you're going the same way. He may have led you to believe that prior to actually taking the stand, but the first... Right. I mean, we got to get into what did he say when he took the stand? The time we saw him, he was saying that he couldn't say anything without the bar um, of Georgia essentially giving him an opinion that he could, had an in-camera conversation with the judge about this very issue. And really, I mean, it was no easy feat trying to get him to answer a single one of your questions, even when you sent him a text message. Right. It was very difficult. And I could tell when he when he was testifying, he looked at me and said, I'm trying to save my law license. And I knew based on the timeline that the weekend before he had received a phone call from Mr. Wade to his best friend who had reminded him of his privilege. So at that point, I knew and you can almost tell my demeanor changed in my questioning at that point, because when he said that, I knew that he was worried about protecting his law license and he was not going to explain anything in detail. And so it was going to was going to be incumbent upon me to pull out those text messages and to remind him of everything that we've talked about. So essentially, she's saying that at, at some point she realized that he was, in fact, going to be a witness that was adverse. You might not, even, you might even say combative, but probably a better word is adverse. Was not going to give her what she needed because he is worried about his law, law license. His law license absolutely being on the line, number one, because he was concerned about privilege. But as we saw, the judge said, well, actually, there is no privilege. I've looked at all the documents you wanted me to look at. I talked to you. I talked to your lawyer. There's no privilege. So you can testify without breaking privilege. So boom, that's gone, right? You're not going to lose your law license. I don't believe based on the law, based on privilege. Then the question became, okay, without that privilege protection, 
why are you not answering these questions in the way that I want you to answer them in the way that you told me before? If you're being completely truthful before, if we had these text exchanges and you're being honest with me and I'm asking you what I'm asking you today on the stand based on those truthful conversations you had with me and all of a sudden now you have either amnesia or you're talking about, I don't know, I don't recall, or no, you're mischaracterizing my testimony. What's what's good with that? Again, I really think this, this relationship is interesting because Ashley Merchant and Terrence Bradley were friends, or at least colleagues, right? They've known each other for a very long time. And so this is what happens when you have this private conversation between two colleagues, and now it's in court and you're being cross-examined because you have information you probably thought was never going to come to light. And so that's what we have here. You're suggesting that whatever phone call may have been made by Nathan Wade through a best friend as intermediary to his former counsel was somehow witness tampering? Or are you just saying that he was reminding him of an attorney-client relationship? Well, we made those allegations in court that it wasn't, we didn't make the allegations that it was actually witness tampering, mm -hmm. but he did call who was under subpoena and told him through a friend to pass along a message to remind him that he had privilege. And so I do think that that was something that, um, that Mr. Bradley internalized. And that was the first time I had heard privilege. So prior to that, we had never heard the term privilege in all of our conversations. And we've been talking for months. The term privilege had never come up. That had never been something where, you know, Mr. Bradley had said, oh, let me tell you this, but it's privilege. Nothing like Ooh. that. So the first time that word even came up was when Mr. Wade interjected it into the conversation. I wonder if there was more than one goal here, because on the one hand, disqualification was certainly the goal. It was stated as such in your motion. But it seemed as though another goal was to perhaps fatally, fatally undermine the credibility of this prosecution team, which, frankly, is the right of defense counsel to zealously advocate for their clients. Do you think you were successful in trying to undermine the credibility of the prosecuting mm -hmm. team? Well, that was never a goal, and it's unfortunate that their conduct is what led to that, but we did uncover a lot of conduct that I do think undermined their credibility, um, rightfully so. I think there's a lot of questions on their credibility. I think there's a lot of questions on misspending, um, you know, through, there were a lot. This is interesting because I definitely thought that that was one of the goals of the defense attorneys. I thought that was a strategy to help them with their case, right? As, as a defense attorney, that is something that you have every right to do, especially if you do think that there's poor conduct and that the the conduct of the district attorney should be undermined and is not credible. So it's interesting to hear Ashley Merchant deny those allegations and say that that wasn't one of the goals here. A lot of things that we were not able to bring because it wasn't relevant. So there were a lot of questions that you would hear objected to and I was not able to go into because of relevance, particularly the money issues. So we weren't able to establish all of that because we weren't permitted to go into that because of relevancy grounds. But I do think that now there's a lot of other entities that are investigating and they'll be able to determine hopefully whether or not there was any misspending of public money, whether or not there were any other things that were going on that were illegal. Of course, that was what the judge pointed out in terms of the relevancy and thinking about normally if there is an issue of credibility or otherwise, you take them down to the bar, the Georgia State Bar I'm talking about, not the drinking kind to, to right. deal with ethical issues of this nature. But on that point, you, you really didn't think that, that, that bringing up um, and having a motion to disqualify Nathan Wade and Fonnie Willis as the DA based on what you said was you know a lack of candor and really intimating lying to the court that that would have an impact on their credibility? Right. Oh, no, I definitely knew that that would have an impact. What I said was that's not my goal. So that wasn't my goal. And, you know, it's one of those things as a defense lawyer, when you have information, you sit there and you think, if I do not use this, if I don't file this motion, no matter what harm it does to me, if I don't file that, am I going to one day be on the stand testifying at a post-conviction hearing explaining why I had all this information and why I had case law to back it up and I didn't file that motion? I want you to listen carefully to what the defense attorney was saying there. What she's saying is that if she had this information that was relevant to her client's defense, so relevant that it could aid in her client being found not guilty in the case being acquitted, all of these things, and she didn't file that motion, she could be in trouble on appeal later when the appellate court comes and looks at her and says, your client is saying that you did a horrible job representing him because you had this information in your possession and you did not file this motion. So as a defense attorney, she's saying that she has to weigh those options when she's thinking about filing or not to file this motion, whether it's going to blow, blow back on her and her client later on. And she has to do what's in the best interest of her client. And then the best interest of her client in this particular case was to file that motion with the information that she had. That's what she's arguing here. That's what she's, that is what she's explaining here we're in a position a lot of folks don't you know who have never done what we do who've never done defense work may not understand that when we have this information and mr bradley called me and gave me all this information 
information. I followed up on it and I tracked it all down. But once I had all that and I had the case law that supported my arguments, I had a duty to bring that motion. So if I had not done that, I actually would have been deficient in my own performance. Well, you know, the judge did not think you met the burden, but taking a big picture for a second. I mean, we all remember this moment when Fannie Willis, the DA, held up the paperwork and the motions, actually requested the motions that she could hold up for you in court. She, you accused her of lying. She accused you of the same in open court. How do you respond to that? I mean, at the time, I wasn't the one who was testifying. I very much wish I could have been testifying. And so that was difficult because, you know, when you're an advocate and you're in court, you're asking the questions, you don't really get the opportunity to testify. And I had to wait until the judge ruled, um, you know, out of fairness, until he ruled on the motion before I could actually address those issues. But it's 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 very unfortunate when someone is calling you something and you know that it's not true and you can't really defend yourself. Um, that seemed you know, to be her Willis point, too, the- right? So essentially what the defense attorney is saying here is that Fonnie Willis was calling her a liar, you know, every name but a child of God. No, she didn't, she didn't do all that, but she did say you lied in this motion. And what the defense attorney is saying, she doesn't have an opportunity to argue back or present her side because you can't as the attorney on the case that is cross-examining a witness, your, your job and your only function there is to ask questions and respond to objections and maybe even make objections if you have the ability, if it's the proper time to do that. Right. But your job is to ask questions. You don't get to go back and forth and have this banter with the witness while the witness is calling you a liar. In that moment, she wishes that she was able to respond, but she wasn't able to. And now the anchor is saying, well, isn't that the point that Fonnie Willis was making? Right. You said all this stuff, you had all these allegations that you filed all these motions and she didn't have an opportunity to defend herself. And at that moment in time, she had that opportunity. Right. Well, but she had the opportunity on the stand. You know, she had the opportunity on the stand. She had the ability to bring other evidence. If she wanted, she could have brought other evidence. And I can tell you, if someone was accusing me of having an affair that I wasn't having, and I had evidence such as text records, such as phone records, such as credit card receipts, you better believe I would have brought that to court. Well, that's interesting because, you know, I might hold you to that when you talk about whether your own client will take the stand in his own defense, because right. one could argue if you don't. Exactly. So this is crazy. And I do not know. I, Attorney Merchant, I do not know why you said that. So she basically said, if somebody's accusing me of having an affair, if someone's accusing me of doing something I didn't do, I would bring all my receipts forward and show that that's not true. I'm not doing what you said that I'm doing. But the as a defense attorney, that's a wild thing to say because we are always talking about how the, the burden is not on us. The burden is on the prosecution. They need to bring all their evidence. And as a defense attorney, you don't have to bring stuff to court to disprove whatever the prosecution is saying. So now the anchor is going to be like, okay, well, interesting that you're saying that. So why don't we keep that same energy? And you don't want us to say, and, and rightfully so, we shouldn't be saying that if Ashley Merchant's client decides not to testify, which maybe he will, maybe he won't. But if he decides not to testify, if he doesn't bring any evidence to, dis- to refute what the state is saying, that he's guilty, right? We would never say that. It's wrong to say that. It's just incorrect as a matter of law and as a matter of fact, in my opinion. Um, and so for her to say, well, if you didn't do it, you should bring evidence refuting what you didn't do is is wild. I just don't. Why would you say that? You don't have the burden of proof. You don't have to do anything to do so. But I'll move on for a second on that point, because you mentioned the word relevance. And for so many people who were looking at this motion and this trial, they thought to themselves, OK, well, they were leaning in because it was intriguing, to say the least. But none of it went to any of the facts alleged in the underlying indictment against the defendants in this case, against any of the defendants in this case, including former president, let alone your own client. Um, And it was meant to simply be a way to stall or delay and not have this case be heard before the looming presidential election. Um, Why do you not want the American people to hear a conclusion of this trial before that election? Ooh, oh, I very, I very much would like to go to trial. Um, but the problem is, and the, and I think the reason that a lot of the public didn't really understand what was behind this, or you know, the reasons for filing this, is because they may not understand due process in our constitution. We have a right to have a fair and impartial prosecutor evaluate the case, and that didn't happen in this case. I saw that in the Washington Post, they reported that um, the former president, Donald Trump, liked your motion motion so much that they had an aide ask his lawyer, Steve Sadow, to call you and congratulate you. Is that true? And what was your reaction to that call? My reaction to that article was very surprised. I was surprised, and I don't know who who talked about that. Um, You know, I did not 
have, I didn't have any help. So, you know, I think it's important to, to look back at how this began. This was, this is what we're going to hear right here, right? So Ashley Merchant has been fighting the allegations that she's working for Trump. She's Trump's puppet. She's just filing that motion so that she can help Trump delay, delay, delay this case until he gets to trial. So what she's going to explain here is number one, she's not Trump's defense attorney, which is correct. She's not Trump's defense attorney. But number two, Trump's defense attorney, Steve Sadow, actually didn't help her file this motion, corroborate this motion. And from my understanding, did not even join in the motion until later on. She had filed the motion. And then later on, the other defense attorneys had an opportunity to decide whether they wanted to join in the motion or not. So what she's going to explain here is that this had nothing to do with Trump. This was my client. This was information I found out. And I filed it on behalf of my client. And whether Trump's attorneys or the Trump himself wanted to join going into the motion later on, that's up to them to do, but that was not how this all started. So that's what I think she's going to explain here. Me. This was not an effort by anyone else. I filed this alone. And if you look back at the timeline, I filed this on the deadline that my motions were due. Nobody joined my motion for well over a week. And you even see Donald Trump's lawyer in court a few days later saying he had to evaluate whether or not he was even going to join it. So I think that is clear evidence that this was not an effort. This was not a you know an effort by anyone else. And so I know that everybody likes to sort of lump all of the defendants together and say, oh, well, this was, you know, Donald Trump's motion or this, you know, this was his, this is his lawyer or something like that. I represent Michael Roman. That is who I represent. That is my duty. And I was the only one that filed this motion. Mm -hmm. I had help once they all joined. And I was very pleased to have the team, you know, surround me and embrace the motion and embrace all the evidence that I had developed. But I want to be clear that this was not a motion filed by anybody else. This all right. And that pretty much summarizes what she's saying. Essentially, she finishes by driving home the point that this was her motion. She did not help have help. And she is not a puppet on behalf of Donald Trump. I definitely think it's interesting that Ashley Merchant has done at least two interviews since the decision came down. I know she did one on the AJC. I'm looking at this one on CNN and I'm, I'm sure she's done, you know, work the circuit kind of talking about this case. And it's interesting because Judge McAvee in the order did point or did indicate that he might be willing to sign a gag order in this case, meaning that the prosecution can't talk about the case, but also the defense can't talk about the case. And you see that the defense attorneys have not moved for that, right? And my speculation and my belief is because they want to be able to talk to the media about the case. This is a great tool for defense attorneys to kind of get their message, get their part out there, something that prosecutors are not as able to do as freely. So we'll be watching as this case does go up on appeal. The Georgia Court of Appeals will have the decision about whether they want to take up the case or not. If they don't take up the case, the Georgia Supreme Court also has an opportunity to decide if they want to review the case or not. And we'll just have to see what happens. My name is Alicia Luncheon. I'm a criminal defense and personal injury attorney in Atlanta, Georgia. Please don't don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel and I will see you all next time.